Today, we are going to look at the 10th commandment. You shall not covet, as we talk about covet not. The 10 commandments end with this powerful commandment found in Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The 10th commandment, you shall not covet, lies at the basis of all the other 10 commandments. I've read scholars point out how the element of covetousness is found in some way in all the other commandments. Now, the word covetousness comes from a Greek word, which means grasping for more. So it comes from a basic discontentment and dissatisfaction in life and kind of a jealousy and envy maybe for what others have or just a basic discontentment with who we are and what we have in life. Contentment means to be satisfied and happy with what we have and where we are in life. And contentment is both the ability to be satisfied in life and to be also ambitious. You can have the two values in your life. You can be content, join where you are, grateful for where you are, and at the same time have aspirations to achieve more without being discontent. Someone asked me recently if any of the great people in the Bible were ambitious people, and I said all of them were. Abraham dreamed of a great nation God told him he would have, and Joseph had a dream of being a ruler and providing for people. Jesus, even in his humanity, was ambitious to save the world. Paul the Apostle and the Apostles were ambitious to carry the gospel of, of Christ to the world. Mary, who was willing to bring Jesus into the world, talk about an ambitious woman, Esther, who was willing to become the queen, even though she might not have thought she deserved it. She was willing to take that step of faith. All the great men and women of the scripture, Deborah the judge in the Old Testament that rose to the challenge and led Israel in battle and in spiritual leadership. So all the great men and women of the Bible were ambitious people, but not for themselves, but to fulfill God's purpose in their life. So I don't want you to think that being content in life is a passive life, that you don't set goals and dreams. That's not true. But covetousness is kind of an envy of what other people have and just a basic discontentment and dissatisfaction with life. And that's what the commandment says, you shall not covet. And here it's focusing on what other people have, on your neighbor, on other people. So let's talk about what we covet, the things that we covet that are identified here. First of all, are our possessions. He says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Well, that just represents all that they possess financially, where they are in their lifestyle. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 6 and 10 that the love of money is the root of all evil, that it lies at the basis. It doesn't say that money's the root of all evil. Money is an important part of life, but the love of it, the, the unhealthy pursuit of it to the expense of everything else. And so the commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, means don't look around at what other people have, the house they live in or the, the money they make or the car they drive and get jealous of them and envious, but be satisfied with where you are. Now, maybe you want a house like that one day. Maybe you'd like to drive that kind of car. There's nothing wrong with that. But you're not coveting what they have. And he talks about not coveting people. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Well, this commandment is reflecting back on the other commandment, you shall not commit adultery, unfaithfulness in marriage. That when people get dissatisfied and they get discontent in their marriage, then they begin to seek a relationship with someone else. And so adultery is a form of covetousness, of coveting another person of their relationship. Hebrews 13, 4 says that marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure but adulterers and the sexually immoral, God will judge. In other words, there are consequences for that type of sexual behavior outside the covenant of marriage. And we all know of the personal difficulty and the sometimes the physical problems that come and the emotional problems that come from unfaithfulness. So covetousness can also be directed at people. And then the position you have in life. He says, anything that belongs to your neighbor. And he talks about the servants, which for us would be the employees that someone has or the size of the company. He talks about the ox or the donkey. And I'm sure none of us have that unless you live on a farm. But he means they're in the agricultural age, all of their tools, all of their equipment. These are, these are words and 
things that describe a person's position in life. They're very successful. When you read about Abraham and all the, the ox that he had and the sheep and the size of his farms, or Job, for example, we see these men in an agricultural age that had possessed so much, and they were great men. So he's talking about the position a person achieves in life, their level of success. And the commandment says, don't envy, don't covet someone's position of authority. Someone at work, someone in politics, someone in ministry. You say, I want to, I want to get to where they are. There's nothing wrong with wanting to aspire in your life. But there is something wrong about being envious and jealous and coveting what someone else has that makes us discontent and dissatisfied with where we are today. And Jesus talked to his disciples about coveting positions of authority. That went on even among the 12 apostles at the time. They argued about who's the most important, who's the greatest. James and John came and said, we want to sit at your right hand and left hand when you come into the kingdom. We want the two highest positions of authority. And Jesus cautioned them about that. In Mark chapter 10, verse 43 through 45, he said, the Gentiles lord their authority over others, not so with you. Whoever wants to be the greatest among you must be your servant. Who wants to be first must be the slave or the servant of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. When we want to be a servant of others, it protects us from the sin of covetousness where we covet the position someone has in life. But why do we covet? Where does this sin come from? First of all, envy of what others possess. We're envious. We want it for ourselves. Second of all, we're jealous. We just feel like we've been shorted, we've been cheated. We feel like other people have been privileged and we haven't been. We feel like we've been left out. And so we begin to be jealous over what other people have. The emphasis on entitlement that we often hear taught and advocated today is driven by jealousy. And it is true that there are certain privileges, but everybody gets privileged sometimes, and then everybody gets overlooked sometimes. And so when people feel like they're always left out and they begin to develop an attitude, they become jealous of others, and that's what leads people into covetousness. So covetousness comes from envy. We want what they've got. It becomes jealous. We're just mad that they've got it, and we don't, and we feel entitled to it. And then sometimes it's discontentment. We just don't like where we are in life. And that may happen naturally, but discontentment as an attitude is something very different because you can change your lifestyle. You can say, well, I'm tired of being in this place. And you can set new goals for your, your life, your family. Uh, you can move from the place you're living. Uh, you can work and change your lifestyle. I mean, you and I, if we get to the place that we just don't like where we are anymore, don't say there's so long you get so discontent and mad and feel like you've been left out and feel like everybody else is getting a break but you. And the fourth reason for covetousness is ingratitude, when people aren't grateful for the blessings of God. And this is the problem with atheism and agnosticism, when, when people don't have a real meaningful faith. And a lot of people are religious, but they don't really have a, a sense of, of uh, the honor of God or the worship of God or the presence of God. I mean, they go to the church or the synagogue, and they, they have a form of religion, but as soon as the service is over, they forget all about God. And they go through the week, and they complain about everything, and they feel like they're left out. But you see, a real person of faith lives in praise. Praise becomes the perpetual attitude. You know, the psalmist said in Psalm 113, verse 3, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. In Psalm 119, verse 164, David said, seven times a day do I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Think about that. He took seven praise breaks a day. And that praise and gratitude, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So the ingratitude, when people take the blessings of God for granted, and they just feel like they're lucky, or they don't even stop to think about where the blessings come from. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 40 through 48, Jesus talked about how that God calls the sun to rise on the grateful and the ungrateful, that he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The only difference of the righteous and the unrighteous is the righteous person looks up to heaven, thanks God for the rain and for the sun. They know where the blessings come from. The other person's living on this grace of God and takes it all for granted. And that is the breeding ground for covetousness. Now, how can we avoid being covetous in our own hearts? 
How can we not covet? Well, first of all, be content. Be happy. Be satisfied with where you are. And today, just say, I'm going to be happy where I am. I may want to make some changes. I may want some other things, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'm grateful today. I'm happy where I am. I'm satisfied. You know, every now and again, you've got to give yourself some credit for where you are and what you've accomplished. Not just keep looking for something else, grasping for more, being content with where you are today. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And he was in prison when he wrote that. And he says, I've learned to have plenty. And I've learned how to be in need, but I have found happiness and satisfaction in spite of the changing circumstances of my life. His happiness, his contentment, his satisfaction came from within. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 through 6, the Bible says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. The second thing that we can do to avoid covetousness is to be grateful for what you have. In everything, give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18. What a powerful truth for life. In everything, in the midst of everything. Now, you don't have to thank God for everything in the sense that bad things are coming from God. Not in that sense. But even if bad things are happening, you can be grateful inside of that difficult time. Grateful for the grace of God. Grateful for the blessings of God. Grateful for all the miracles you've seen in your life. Grateful for the friends that you've had and that you have now. Grateful for the experiences of life. You can be grateful for what you had in the past. Grateful for what God's doing today. Even grateful for His promises tomorrow. There's plenty to be grateful for. It's a discipline of the mind and of the mouth to be grateful. We can focus on what we don't like. We can focus on all kind of grievances. And then we can articulate those grievances. And that's what leads us into covetousness and jealousy and envy for what other people have and what they've achieved in life. But if you're grateful every day, take time during the day to say, Lord, I thank you and praise you. If nothing else is going great and you know Christ is your Savior, you've got a whole long list of the graces of God in your life to be grateful for. I like to start all my praise with what's going on spiritually. Now, I don't like to start my praise with what's going on around me because that stuff changes. It's God's love for me, God's faithfulness to me. That becomes a source of my gratitude, God's mercy in my own life. I'm so grateful for Him, for His existence, for His work, for His power, for His providence. I'm grateful for Jesus coming into the world to save us from our sins. I'm grateful for the gospel that I heard at a young age and understood God so loved the world. I would encourage you to start your praise and your gratitude on what happens to you spiritually, not circumstantially, because those are the greater blessings. These blessings around us are fantastic, but things in life change. They come and go. Possessions come and go. Positions come and go. Jobs come and go. Relationships come and go. This is a temporary world we're living in. And if all of your praise is based on your circumstance, as soon as the bottom falls out, then you're going to be mad and upset and angry, doubting perhaps or fearful or, or at worst covetous of what other people, because they're not going through a hard time. But if you're grateful for God's grace and presence in your life and you walk with God and experience the presence of God and you think about the benefits, you know, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul writes, even from a Roman cell, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Start with your spiritual blessings. You're chosen, you're predestined, you're loved, you're forgiven. You're secure, you have eternal life. You have the promises of God that are real, even if you're going through the biggest problem, to know God's going to get you out of it. So the way that we overcome covetousness is to be content with what we have, say, I'm satisfied today, I'm happy. Yeah, I've got some other goals, but I'm really happy today, and I'm going to enjoy this day. I enjoy who I am. I enjoy where we are. I'm going to enjoy my family. I'm going to enjoy my job. Even if you're looking for a new job, enjoy the one you've got. That's being content. And be grateful. And start with the inside and then go to the outside. Start with the spiritual blessing and then praise God for the temporal blessings. To finally, be ambitious for what you want to achieve in life. You can be content and ambitious, happy, satisfied with where you are today and what you have, and also setting new goals. 
I'm very grateful and very thankful for what I have today and God's blessings are great. I'm also very ambitious. I'm always setting new goals and dreaming new dreams for my life and for our church. So you can be content and ambitious. And if you're ambitious for what you want, it will help protect you from being jealous of what other people have. You see, people that are pursuing their own goals don't have time to look around and be jealous of what other people have accomplished because you're, you're on your own journey. You're setting your own goals. Philippians 3, 14, Paul said, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So be content, be grateful, be ambitious. Thank God every day for his grace and blessings and you and I can live free from covetousness. Join me in prayer. Lord, today we pause to thank you for your amazing love and grace and faithfulness to us. And I pray for your people that you'll give them a sense of contentment today, a sense of gratitude, and a new sense of ambition to pursue their dreams and the goals that they have for your glory and for them to build a better life in Jesus' name. I've enjoyed this study. I trust that you've been enriched by studying the Ten Commandments. Get a copy of my new book, 10 Guidelines for Greatness. Learn a lot more about the Ten Commandments. And this has been a great study. These are guidelines for greatness. These Ten Commandments help guide us into the fullness of life God has for us. Let me encourage you to get the Mount Perrin app today. If you haven't done so as of yet, make sure you download it today. Get as many friends and family you can to download the app. They'll begin to experience the Word of God and share the ministry of the church together. The David Cooper YouTube channel, Pastor David Cooper, go and subscribe today. Join me, become part of the community. Also the Mount Perrin YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe. Let's partner together in life and in ministry. Sunday's coming. I'm looking forward to seeing you and your family in church on campus. If not online, we're gonna worship the Lord together. Make sure you invite somebody to come to church with you this Sunday as well. Thank you for your faithful partnership in ministry. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.